Good morning, everybody. I request the, our beloved president, immediate past president, uh, our uh, yeah, yeah. our oration uh, committee nominee, Dr. Pratiba, and uh, our first uh, oration awardee, Dr. Jyotirme Biswas, to come on stage, please. So good morning, everyone. It's indeed my pleasure to invite all of you for this general body. I call the meeting call to order. We'll start with the uh, welcome note. So indeed a great pleasure to take over as the 70th president of the Minado of Thalmic Association. Thank you so much for this opportunity and honor. Uh, let's move on. We've, uh, because of want of quorum, we've uh, delayed the proceedings by 15 minutes. And let's uh, move on with the third agenda, homage to our departed members. I request secretary to announce the names. Uh, we've lost three of our year members in the last one year. Dr. Ben Ravindran from Nagar Koil, Dr. Sadik from Erode, and Dr. Kalimullah from Velur. I request everybody to stand up and observe one minute silence in memory of the departed souls. Thank you. We'll move on to the orations. The first oration will be the Dr. J. Joseph Nyanadikam Oration Award. Uh, video, please. Thanks to Dr. Deepak of Joseph A. Hospital for preparing a nice introductory video about Dr. Joseph, his life, and his accomplishments, his connection with TNOA, and the reason why the award was instituted. In ophthalmology, a visionary figure emerged, leaving an indelible mark on the field and on countless lives. Dr. Joseph Nyanadikam, born on the 14th of July 1900 in Coimbatore, India, began life amid challenges, losing his father even before birth. Raised alongside his sisters by a dedicated and resilient mother, Dr. Joseph's character was shaped by compassion and fortitude. In 1919, his journey in medicine commenced as a military pupil at the Royapura Medical School. With unwavering dedication, he earned his medical diploma in 1924, setting the stage for a remarkable career that would redefine eye care in India. He then went on to pursue higher medical education and ophthalmology training at several centers in Europe, including Vienna, Paris and Berlin. These formative years enriched his expertise and nurtured his passion for advancing eye care. In 1934, Dr. Joseph arrived in Trichy, a city where he would etch his name in the hearts of countless patients. Together with his wife, Mrs. Soundra Nayagam, he established the Dr. Joseph Eye Hospital in 1936, a beacon of hope and healing for those afflicted with eye ailments. 
but his aspirations transcended the walls of the hospital. He was one of the pioneers to introduce community-based eye camps for the poor and needy. Driven by a deep sense of responsibility to the visually impaired, he founded transformative institutions such as the High School for the Blind and the Bishop Teal Rehabilitation Center. His unwavering dedication also led to the creation of the Orbit Workshop for the Blind and a Rehabilitation Center for Blind Women in Trichy. In 1951, Dr. Joseph's vision extended beyond Trichy when he invited ophthalmologists from all over Tamil Nadu to gather for an informal meeting to share his vision. Inspired by his proposals, the Madras State of Talmic Association was born in 1952, uniting both private and government eye surgeons in the state to serve rural communities through fellowship, eye camps and educating the masses about eye care. It was this association started by him that has grown into a present-day Tamil Nadu of Talmic Association, the TNOA. The year 1962 witnessed an act of unparalleled generosity when Dr. Joseph selflessly dedicated his privately owned Joseph I Hospital to the Tamil Evangelical Lutheran Church. This transformed the hospital into a charitable non-profit institution ensuring it served all, regardless of caste, creed or affordability. He went on to occupy several prominent positions both state and nationwide, including the president of the National Indian Medical Association, a testament to his leadership and influence in the medical community. Dr. Joseph's life journey came to a close on the 14th of January 1983, leaving behind a legacy that continues to inspire IK professionals worldwide. The annual Dr. Joseph Nyanadikam Gold Medal Oration Award was instituted in 1983 to honor his pioneering spirit and exceptional contributions to ophthalmology. Every year, this award is presented to remarkable individuals who exemplify the same values and attributes that define Dr. Joseph's life. A profound commitment to patient care, dedication to advancing ophthalmology and an unwavering passion for serving those in need. In honoring these recipients, we pay tribute to the enduring legacy of Dr. Joseph Nyanadikam. As torchbearers of his vision, they continue to make a profound impact on eye care, improving lives and ensuring that the gift of sight reaches every corner of society. I now request Dr. Pratibha, Director of Joseph I Hospital, to introduce the awardee. A pleasant morning and a pleasant day ahead to uh, one and all gathered here. I first of all, on uh, behalf of TNOA and Team JEH, uh, the Joseph Nyana Dikam Memorial Committee, I congratulate uh, Dr. Jyotirmas uh, J. Biswas uh, for being the awardee uh, to the prestigious Dr. Joseph Nyana Dikam Gold Medal Oration Award. So, Dr. Biswas. Dr. Biswas uh, completed his fellowship training in vitreo retinal surgery from Shankar and Netralia and he obtained further specialization in ophthalmic pathology from Done Eye Institute. Um, he has published uh, 400, 504 articles in index journals, 65 chapters in the books of ophthalmology and he has presented over 300 papers in national and international conferences. He has authored five books on avioitis and one book on ophthalmic pathology. He is a visiting professor at the Advanced Eye Care Center at uh, Postgraduate Institute, PGI-MER, Chandigarh, and the Chinese University of Hong Kong. 
He is a proud recipient of uh, as many as 50 awards, including the prestigious Alembic Research Award from the ICMR, uh, given away by the Honorable President of India. He is a member of the International Uveitis Study Group, American Uveitis Society, and the International Ocular Inflammation Society, and is a fellow of the Indian College of uh, Pathologists. He is a founding member and the past president of the Uveitis Society of India and he is a founding president of the Society of Inflammation and Research. He was the first to describe ocular lesions in, the, uh, in AIDS in India. And he has been ranked in the 8th position amongst the top 2% of Indian researchers in ophthalmology by the Stanford uh, Stop Rated Research Ranking. Currently, he is the director of Uveitis and Ophthalmic Pathology Department at Shankaranetralaya, Chennai. So, we are proud to present this uh, prestigious award to uh, Professor Jyotirmay Biswas and we wish him success in his future endeavors. Good morning to all. Thank you, Dr. Pratibha, for kind introduction. <coughs> I never thought 38 years back in 1985 when, it, when I uh, participated in TNA conference in Tanjabur, I didn't have any presentation. I didn't know how to make a presentation or make a paper. Today I'm standing in this podium to give the prestigious Dr. Joseph Ganadikam Oration Award. What a magnanimous personality and what a glorious career he had. And to be uh, recognized and uh, selected for this award committee by, for delivering this Joseph Ganadikam Award, a uh, gold medal oration award, I feel very honored and feel very humbled today in front of all of you to share my thoughts on uh, ocular tuberculosis. So, as uh, has been uh, mentioned about Dr. Joseph Ganadikam, a wonderful video. I'm not going to talk about Dr. Joseph Ganadikam uh, uh, much. And he was born in 1900, and his career and everything has been told in the nice video. I straight go to that, uh, my talk. And today this Joseph Hospital is stands and is a tribute uh, to the community, to the service of, uh, by his, 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 as a recognition of his wonderful services. So the previously about um, uh, 38 people have received this Joseph Ganadikam Oration, Gold Medal Oration Award. There are several luminaries. I feel very humble to be among them. My mentor, uh, Dr. S. S. Badrinath, was one of them. And today I am uh, talking uh, in front of you in TNA audience about uh, my work in um, tubercular uveitis. I dedicate this oration to my mentor, beloved Chief Padman Bhushan, Dr. S. S. Badrinath. Without him, I wouldn't be here. And what I have learned and what I am today is due to this great personality. The, today the topic which I have chosen is battle against ocular tuberculosis. Three decades of my research. Why I chose ocular TB? TB can affect any part of the eye. TB uveitis has protein manifestations can have varied presentation and can be blinding also. TB in the eye is an still an unsolved mystery. My journey of ocular TB research started when I joined Shankar Netralaya, the temple of the eye, as a consultant in 1985. 
and so far I have published 83 articles on ocular TB. So I thought that it would be apt to dis discuss about my research work on ocular TB. I planned my talk in this way, tuberculosis prevalence in India, tubercular uveitis, anterior, intermediate, posterior, pan uveitis, tubercular retinal vasculitis, tubercular sclerosis, and a rare entity, conjunctival tuberculoma. I'll be talking briefly about imaging in TB uveitis, laboratory investigation, radiological investigations, new in management of ocular TB, research on ocular TB. There are several pioneers in this field, but I am going to restrict my talk about my work only and show few cases with you. Let me start with a case. About 30 years back, I saw this patient, 42-year-old woman, dimness of vision in the right eye for 15 days, developed exudative mass near the macula, had raised serum angiotensin converting enzyme and positive QM test. QM test was used for sarcoidosis that time and the patient was given, treated with high dose of oral steroid, elsewhere, and came with multiple subretinal abscess. And you can see this in this picture, the multiple subretinal abscess in the retina. The eye could not be salvaged, unfortunately. It became painful and blind and need to be eviscerated. But when I looked under the microscope in eviscerated tissues, I found myriads of acid fast bacilli in the subretinal space. It amazed me. I thought that how can be the tubercle directly infect the eye uh, without infecting other parts of the body. In fact, TB is a really a diagnostic dilemma. TB or not TB is a perennial question. Which one to call TB, which one not to call TB is a real challenge. And there is a controversy in ocular tuberculosis in the terminology itself, diagnosis, treatment. So it would be apt to discuss some of these aspects in this oration. So how common is TB? TB in India is endemic. Two million people develop TB every year in this country. Every fourth patient of the TB in the world is an Indian. Let me share my humble experience. It was 1985. I had just joined as a consultant after my vitretinal fellowship. I didn't do the vitretinal surgery. I took up a uveitis um, services. I was given a research project, ocular morbidity in active system tuberculosis. I asked the questions, what is the ocular morbidity in active systemic tuberculosis? What are the various types of ocular tuberculosis seen? Is Eels disease seen in active systemic tuberculosis, which is often thought to be due to tuberculosis? And I spent one year in tuberculosis research center in Chetpet, Madras, and I studied 1,005 patients in TB hospital in one year. Ocular morbidity in active systemic tuberculosis was surprisingly low and was 1.39%. Most common was healed focal coronaries, and surprisingly, no case of Eels disease was seen. And this is a miliary tubercular the choroid, which I have seen one of the patients. I brought the patient in an auto from Chetpet to Shankar to take the photograph. And this is a miliary tubercular the choroid, a rare photograph of a ocular tuberculosis. I published this article in International Ophthalmology, Ocular Morbidity in Patients with Active Systemic Tuberculosis. When I looked into the, my UVIT clinic registry, I found in 1992 it was 0.64%. Because it was only chest x-ray was used, only clinical acumen was used to under-diagnose ocular tuberculosis. But when with the advent of high-resolution CT test, PCR in ocular tuberculosis, we found actually tubercular uveitis is not that but uncommon. It is about 22.5 percent in found in 2018. It could be anterior uveitis. Let me show an example. 20-year-old female with granulomatous anterior uveitis, as you see in this picture, with mutton fat capes, broad posterior and peripheral anterior synechia. Is it TB? Yes, it is TB because the PCR for mycobacterium tuberculosis using MPB64 and IS6110 region was positive. Patient responded to a course of anti-tubercular treatment. What about this patient, 40-year-old man, no systemic history, 
And is this TB? Yes, this is also TB. Direct smear culture and PCR was positive, and it was published in American Journal of Ophthalmology case report. Tubercular uveitis presenting as a pigmented hypopian, which is a, one of the very, very rare phenomena. Only other case was reported by Pro Professor Ratnam from Urban High Hospital, Madurai. And here is the case, full chamber, almost full chamber pigmented hypopian and PCR showing mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. Can intermediate uveitis be TB? This 14-year-old girl, bilateral intermediate uveitis, is it due to TB? Yes. High resolution CT chest showed pulmonary infiltrate in the lung parenchyma. And real time PCR from the acetab showed 2,204 copies of the mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. And this, in fact, we have found 22 eyes of 14 cases in our center and which are found to be PCR positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is one of the cases you can see the spillover granulomatous anterior uveitis. And the patient had in the vitreous cavity inferior snowball exudates and the peripheral vitreous membranes. We did the PCR from the vitreous study and then we found nested and real time PCR. Both was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. In fact, we could do that uh, cytopathology of the vitreous exudates and in a case with the dense vitreous opacity of these patients in the right eye. And this patient had undergone a vitrectomy, and this vitreous aspirate showed granuloma, suggestive of a tuberculosis, and PCR was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA also, thus confirming a tubercular intermediate uveitis. Can posterior uveitis be tuberculosis? And this is a patient who presented with a choroidal nodule and is a 26-year-old woman. And this patient had fundus examination, so as left eye showed a choroidal tuberculoma. Is it TB? Yes. That lung in radiological investigation itself has showed that the patient had myelitic tuberculosis. In addition, the patient has got tubercular lymphadenitis, which on cervical lymph node biopsy showed necrotizing granulomatous inflammation. Clinical profile of intraocular TB is very challenging. It is a great mimicker of various uveitis entity and can be vision threatening as I mentioned to you. And I show a case where the, the patient was having a granuloma on the optic nerve head and perivascular sheathing and choriretinitis patches with retinal hemorrhages. Lung lesion responded to antitubercular treatment but ocular infection did not and it loaned to the pan of thermitis and then ultimately thysis bulbi and the eviscerated tissue showed plenty of acid fast bacilli. When we looked at our pathology department registry, we could find out only five cases in 10 year period which has got pathologically and microbiologically proven tuberculosis. And this subretinal abscess was two cases, granulomatous uveitis with scleral perforation, one case, exudative mass in the anterior chamber, one case, quadral mass with pan uveitis, one case. Only five cases in 10 year period. So direct invasion of the tuber tuberculosis in the eye was not that very common. And this is one of the patient, as I showed to you, has a subretinal abscess with acid fast bacilli in the eviscerated tissues. Can pan uveitis be TB? Is that one? We have three cases of tubercular pan uveitis, while mycobacterium tuberculosis genome was detected by nested and real-time PCR. Acid fast bacilli was seen only one case in the retinal pigment epithelium. This is a patient of 25-year-old male who had dimness of vision for six months, manto positive, CT chest normal. In spite of ATT and steroid, patient lost vision. Occlusive pupil and rubiosis I already seen. I became painful and blind. And we thought that is it due to TB? Inucleated globe on histopathological study showed lymphocytic infiltration throughout the retinal layers and uveal tissues with KZS and necrosis as shown in the I arrow that this is very suggestive of tubercular infection. And on the top of it, the PCR was positive for microvectum tuberculosis from the paraffin section from the eyeball which was enucleated. PCR proven tubercular uveitis can be seen in the 25 year old female, and this patient had obviously TB spine, pot spine, and this patient in addition has choroidal tuberculoma. 
And this choroidal tuberculoma responded with the anti-tubercular treatment, and we did the anti-chamber tap, which showed 81 copies of the microactive tuberculosis DNA. And what has happened to the patient? After anti-TB treatment, there's a complete resolution of inflammation. Tuberculosis can present a subretinal abscess. We have seen 12 eyes of 12 patients in 10 year period of time, and all of them responded to a course of anti-tubercular treatment with a steroid. I show an example. This is a 19 year old girl from Uttar Pradesh. I had got a subretinal abscess. And what we did is a final aspiration biopsy, and it took us a lot of dexterity. Dr. Mahesh Shamugam at that time was with, with us, and who gave that, did the sample from the FNAB. And that tiny sample of the FNAB material showed PCR microactive tuberculosis DNA. Look at the patient, what has happened. After three months, there is a complete resolution of inflammation with subretinal abscess complete absorption. This is a 33-year-old male with active ampigenous choroiditis. What is the cause? This was also found to be TB, MPB64 genome for microactive tuberculosis was positive. This, uh, this was published in Ocular Immunology and Inflammation, nested PCR for ampigenous choroiditis positive. Multifocal serpiginoid choroiditis was now thought to be of tubercular etiology. But before that, we could find out the P uh, PCR positivity from a case of a multifocal serpiginoid choroiditis by uh, PCR study. And this is a case of a miliary tuberculosis with a pan uveitis. From the pan uveitis eye, we could find out the microvectum tuberculosis DNA, indicating that this is indeed due to tuberculosis. Retinal vasculitis can be due to TB. This is a 17-year-old girl, very rare case. It is a frozen frosted branch angitis presentation, and this patient had abdominal tuberculosis. What we did, we just treated the patient with anti-tubercular treatment and steroid. Whole frosted branch angitis completely disappeared, and the vision has completely removed, improved. And this was published in Retina case uh, BIP reports. Eels disease is a, always a dilemma um, in the etiology. In 1880, Henry Eels described this disease in Birmingham, and he thought that it is a vasomotor neurosis. Watsworth, five years later, told that it is a inflammation. But nobody knew the cause. It is a, one of the most common causes of retinal vasculitis in our country. One in every 135 eye patients in Shankarnetrala was found to be up due to this disease. Can use disease be due to tuberculosis? There's no way we could find out unless we go into the tissues. We took the vitreous sample of the patients who has undergone vitreous surgery, and we found five out of the 12 samples, almost 50% of the cases were positive for tuberculosis DNA. None were culture positive. This was published in British Journal of Ophthalmology. We also found that the polymerase chain reaction from the detection of microactive tuberculosis DNA in epiretinal membrane of Eels disease patients, and about 47.8% of the epiretinal membrane of the Eels disease was positive for microactive tuberculosis. And in fact, we could find out, we hit the jackpot, when you could find out the actual tubercular DNA in the ocular tissues of the inucleated eyeball of a case of Eels disease. And we could postulate that there is a cell-mediated immunologic reaction triggered by sequestered microbacterium tuberculosis antigen causes Eels disease. We did the histopathological immunohistochemical and molecular biologic study of inucleated specimen of a case of Eels disease. We found CD68, CD3, and CD8 cell positivity indicating immunomodulatory reaction in the pathogenesis of Eels disease, particularly T-suppressor cells involvement. And this patient was positive for microactive tuberculosis DNA by polymerase chain reaction also. Further evidence of association of latent microactive tuberculosis in Eels disease, we found Manto positivity in 73% cases, quantiferent TV gold test 56% cases, HSD test 34% cases, Aquas PCR 33% cases, Vitreous PCR 22% cases. We compiled our data and published and a review article in News Disease and Update in Survey of Ophthalmology in 2002. And this was a landmark article on Eels disease. And, this, uh, and after, after 11 years, we described the current concept in the diagnosis and management of Eels disease. And we 
postulated that based on our molecular biology study, ESG should be considered to the tubercular retinal vasculitis based on that molecular biology study, which was a great breakthrough in the understanding of this enigmatic disease. Tubercular scleritis, this is a patient which amazed me, and this patient had rheumatoid arthritis. We thought that this is due to the uh, rheumatic disease, autoimmune disease. We treated with a steroid immunosuppressive agents, IVMP. The patient did not respond, lost follow-up, came with a perforation of the globe. I became painful and blind and inucleated. When we looked at the inucleated globe histopathology, we found that there is a granuloma formation to the giant cells with a non granulomatous inflammation. And this patient was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA, was uh, positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA from the paraffin section, indicating that the scleritis, which I thought to be autoimmune, was due to tuberculosis. And this was published in Ocular Immunology and Inflammation. We could have uh, found out a case of a tubercular scleroeuveitis, which presented as an ocular tumor. And the eye was unfortunately inucleated. Inucleated globe did not show tumor. Instead, it showed chronic granulomatous inflammation. PCR from the paraffin section was positive for mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA, indicating that the tumor was due to tuberculosis, not due to uh, tumor. The mass was due to the tuberculosis. This is a case of a conjunctival tuberculoma, 26-year-old female, history of swelling for one and a half months, marked dimness of vision in the left eye, seven days. You just thought to be by clinician as the squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva. And we did that uh, endless periocular and submandibular lymph node further um, increased the suspicion. But when we did the conjunctival mass excision and under local anesthesia, we found there is a granulomatous inflammation with the giant cells with caseation necrosis, indicating that it is a tubercular infection, and this was positive by um, PCR study also. This is the, I talked about tubercular anterior uveitis, tubercular intermediate uveitis, posterior pan uveitis, retinal vasculitis, tubercular scleritis, conjunctival tubercloma. And now a little bit about the imaging in tubercular uveitis. Simple fundus photograph morphology phenotype can be useful for understanding the tubercular etiology, autofluorescence, FFA, ICG, and SSOCT. And here is a patient presented with a tubercloma of the choroid, and fundus fluorescence angiogram showed initial hypofluorescence, later hypo, hyperfluorescence at the ring, and showing a ring of fire appearance, which is very typical of TB choroidal granuloma. We also did the swept source optical coherence tomography to prognosticate this disease and to document the serial progression of the disease. And we could see that the contact sign is present over here. And this goes, uh, this becomes flattened with the course of treatment and the progression of the disease. Regarding the laboratory technique, MANTU test, quantiferon TB gold test, polymerase chain reaction, which are using for the diagnosis of tubercular uveitis. Is quantiferent TB gold test better than Mantu test? It's a one-time test, and we found that the sensitivity and specificity is much more than Mantu test. We also did the study of polymerase chain reaction in the intraocular fluid from the tuber suspected tubercular uveitis. We found that the sensitivity is 80% and specificity is 100% of the cases. And this is a polymerase chain reaction for microactive tuberculosis DNA from the ocular fluid in patients with various types of choroiditis with spillover anterior uveitis. And we found subretinal abscess in subretinal abscess 87.5%, choroidal tubercloma 50%, and uh, miliary tubercular of the choroid PCR was positive in 100% cases. Radiological diagnosis, we found that if we do x rays it will miss 40% uh, of the tuberculosis. And we found that the role of high-resolution computer typography of the chest in granulomatous uveitis, particularly in TB and sarcoid, 81% TB and 8.3% sarcoidosis could be detected by high-resolution CT chest. New in the management of ocular tuberculosis, in spite of anti-tubercular treatment for drug, a lot of patients do not respond. We have treated a patient with Choroidal granuloma and subretinal abscess with intravitreal bevacizumab 0.05 ml and intravitreal moxifloxacin 500 microgram in 0.1 ml every month, and the patient showed complete regression of the inflammation. 
with the scarring. And this was published in Ocular Immunology and Inflammation. Ocular TB in HIV is a different ball game. It can have myriad of presentation, starting from a small tuberculoma of the choroid, subretinal abscess, conjunctival tuberculoma. 1.9% patient of HIV with ocular lesions can have tubercular uh, ocular lesion. And this most common is the choroidal tubercle followed by the subretinal abscess, um, panophthalmitis, and conjunctival mass. There can be a double trouble. The same patient can be having tuberculosis as well as a cytomegalovirus retinitis and need to be treated for both. In the research front, we are now working on multiplex PCR to differentiate between the tuberculosis and non-tubercular mycobacterium tu tuberculosis to identify the various strains of mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA. What I'm doing now is the flow cytometry of T regulatory cells in presumed tubercular uveitis, and this is a basic science study. And we our study showed that the trig marker CD4 plus CD25 plus and Fox P3 plus were higher in the presumed tubercular uveitis. There's the green uh, channels showing much more increase than comparison to the control. In conclusion. Ocular TB is still a diagnostic and therapeutic challenge. Pathogenesis of various types of ocular TB is still not clear. A lot of research still needs to be done. Needs a more sensitive and precise test and needs more targeted therapy. The most important thing, as Albert Einstein has told, is not to stop questioning. And in case of tubercular uh, uveitis or ocular tuberculosis, it is very true. So at the end, I'd like to thank ASN family for their support and Dr. Joseph Ganadukam committee and the TNA for choosing me to deliver this oration. I really feel humbled and very honored to deliver this oration. Thank you very much. Thank you all for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Biswas, for the wonderful oration. And you are indeed a pioneer and authority on ocular tuberculosis that was reflected in your uh, presentation. And this oration recognition reflects the impact of your valuable contribution to the community and fraternity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much. So next, next we move on to the Dr. G. Venkataswamy Community Ophthalmology Oration. And uh, may I request uh, the oration committee to send the representative to join us in the presentation. Okay. Since RK sir is already here, may I invite uh, Dr. Paraksha to join us. This is the story of a young boy who dreamt about becoming a doctor. I had become a doctor in my village or in my community of that time. I remember vividly when I was seven, hardly five or four or five years old. Next door to also be, I heard a shouting and yelling in the early morning. I was told that the pregnant woman during delivery died. A young woman, hardly twenty years old, suddenly died. You don't see her anymore. And he said, can you not do something to prevent it? Dr. V entered medical school with plans to become an obstetrician. In 1944, he joined the army as a medical officer. Four years later, he was discharged after contracting a rare form of rheumatoid arthritis. This condition left his fingers permanently crippled, barring him from entering into obstetrics. That is how I got to the eye hospital. She had accident. And even after joining the eye hospital, Walking a few steps was difficult, painful. Holding a pen was difficult. And holding surgery was not difficult. It took some years for me to pick up surgery. Despite his illness, Dr. V trained as an eye surgeon and went on to personally perform more than 100,000 successful eye surgeries. In 1965, Dr. V met Sir John Wilson, whose association broadened his outlook and Dr. V began to actively participate in various national and international blindness prevention forums. With Sir John's help, 
he set up a center at Madurai to drastically reduce childhood blindness due to nutritional deficiency. The two men also launched a nationwide eye camp program. Dr. V pioneered the mobile eye camps in Tamil Nadu. At the age of 58, Dr. V retired as a government ophthalmologist. With his brothers and sisters, he opened an 11-bed eye clinic called Aravan, which today provides high-quality, high-volume and affordable eye care to millions of people. Dr. V's commitment to equitable eye care led to the founding of Lab that produces high-quality ophthalmic products. Lycon was founded under his guidance to enhance eye care services worldwide through partnerships, capacity building, training and research. Dr. Venkateswamy's life and mission have been deeply intertwined with a grand purpose and spiritual values guiding numerous institutions and individuals to bring light to even the most remote citizens affected by blindness. Dr. V was one of the earliest members of TNOA and has contributed to the association's growth significantly. To instill Dr. V's noble mission and values among the eye care community, TNOA instituted the Dr. G. Vankateswamy Community Ophthalmology Oration Award in the year 2002. Every year, this award is presented to individuals whose exceptional work has contributed significantly to the field of community ophthalmology. To see is the right of every human being. As a way of honoring the legacy of Dr. V, let us all unite to carry forward his mission to ensure no one remains blind for lack of simple delivery of eye care. So it's my honor and pleasure to introduce the orator for Dr. G. V. Oration, Dr. Parag K. Shah. Dr. Parag did his MBBS from ND MVP Samaj Medical College, Nasik in 1998. He did his DNB Ophthalmology at Arvind Eye Hospital, Madurai in 2002, followed by Surgical Retina Fellowship and ICO Fellowship in Pediatric Retina and Ocular Oncology in USA in 2006. He is currently the consultant in Department of Pediatric Retina and Ocular Oncology at Arvind Eye Hospital, Coimbatore. He is also the DNBPG coordinator at Arvind Coimbatore and vice chairman of the PSG Ethics Committee, Coimbatore. His special interests in treating retinopathy of prematurity and intraocular malignancies like retinoblastoma and choroidal melanoma. Numerous path-breaking and innovative papers and publications uh, have been done by Dr. Paraksha. Significant among them are the AOS Sujata Savitri Rao Award in 2010 and VRSA Best Video Award in 2014. He is also the recipient of AOS CS Reshmi Award and APAO Achievement Award, Dr. Akbar Endowment Award at Sarojini Devi Eye Hospital. He is a visiting professor for Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences, University of Edinai, and also member of the third international classification of retinopathy of prematurity, a crop. So under the USAID and SEVA funded program, his team is testing low cost camera system in ROP telescreening, uh, which is uh, really expensive at present, and also role of artificial intelligence in ROP diagnosis with the US collaboration with CASI Eye Institute and University of Edinai. With such significant contribution to ophthalmology and uh, particularly in the field of pediatric ophthalmology, TNOA is happy to recognize the services and uh, award Professor uh, Dr. G. V. Uh, Community Ophthalmology Oration for this year 2020-23. I request Dr. Paraksha to deliver his oration. Dr. Paraksha, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. And uh, at the outside, uh, I'd like to
thank uh, the outgoing and the past president, Dr. R.K. sir, the incoming and the new president, uh, Dr. Nirmal sir, uh, Dr. Sriram Gopal, uh, the Honorary General Secretary, uh, the senior leadership and the management of uh, Arvind Eye Care System. Uh, to you know, give me this, uh, to choosing me for this uh, oration, the prestigious oration, and uh, I'm also quite uh, humbled and actually overwhelmed by this uh, uh, this uh, honor. So uh, I'm going to start with this uh, quote that uh, if you want to enhance your world, focus your attention on others. Uh, it makes you part of something greater than yourself. On this philosophy, Dr. V led his life, and on this same philosophy, he started the Arvind Eye Care System. So I'm going to talk uh, on my journey towards community ophthalmology, and I'm going to concentrate on mainly two diseases, mainly the retinopathy of prematurity, and end up with a few slides on retinoblastoma. So I was born and brought up in the uh, city called Nasik in uh, Maharashtra, which is a tier two city. And uh, uh, although it's a temple city, I was born and I was brought up in the urban parts of Nasik, living in a flat, or till my MBBS. And, and then after my MBBS, I moved on to Pune to a, to a uh, eye hospital there, hoping to get a PG seat within six months. But uh, fortunately, I passed the DNB part one and I got called by Arvind Eye Hospital Madurai that to, on the, from the waiting list when someone didn't join. And overnight, I took an unreserved train sleeper compartment and made this journey by train to Madurai. And that is how I landed in Arvind Eye Hospital Madurai and did my three years DNB training there. And uh, I really, really enjoyed my time there. And after Madurai, I moved on to the adjoining city of Coimbatore for my retina fellowship. And Coimbatore was a little more sort of uh, urban, uh, urban, uh, more in, or more affluent uh, city at least during those times compared to Madurai. So what happened when I moved this urban city in 2002? This city was struck by, struck by an urban disease called as retinopathy of prematurity. Now, why I'm calling ROP as an urban disease? If you see historic, histor uh, historically, the ROP epidemic starts first in the developed nations in 1940s and 80s, when the NICUs were just introduced and oxygen was given for the survival of more and more preterm babies. And when the developing nations also started having these NICUs, the ROP started slowly evolving in our nations also. In the same way, in India also, it started from the Tier 1 cities, moved on to Tier 2, and then to Tier 3, and now we have the rural India also. So in, in Tamil Nadu, it started from Chennai, uh, and then it moved on to Coimbatore. Coimbatore was the next uh, affluent city to you know, come up with the NICUs because of the industries there. And then it moved on to the other cities of Tamil Nadu, and now we know it's gone to the, all the rural uh, hospitals because the government of India has started SNCUs in every district hospital. So now ROP is more of a general problem, not, not only to the urban areas. So what was atypical during that time, during my fellowship, that I was seeing more of these atypical, what we call as a fulminate ROP, now it is called the aggressive ROP. And these atypical fulminate ROP, the, the treatment rates also was extremely high that time, at around 33%. The, the actual is only 2 to 5 percent treatable ROP, but that time the, the, it was extremely high. And out of these, more than two thirds were this atypical ROP, and we could not understand why it is happening. What was even more atypical that the mean gestational age and the birth weight of these babies was way higher than the conventional ROP. During the same time in uh, 2005, the ICROP uh, revisited article the, uh, was published. And they introduced this term called aggressive posterior ROP, which should happen only in the tiniest babies. So when we compared our data to the West, we saw that our uh, mean gestational and birth weight were way off the charts compared to the uh, Western population. Now, why was this happening? So what we observed that most of these babies were coming from NICUs, which use unmonitored, unblended oxygen, two to five liters per minute immediately after birth or longer, using a non-rebreather funnel mask. And some NICUs were using more of a hood. And so when we changed, we asked these NICUs to change to a funnel to the hood, which is a sort of a crude form of blending air with oxygen. We saw a dramatic reduction in this aggressive ROP, all the most like from, from 30%, it went to 0% in one of these NICUs. So based on these results, we, we have published the two articles in 2005-2012, and 
and based on these articles we were invited to be a part of the icrob3 and we were uh, happy that they acknowledged that that uh, aggressive posterior rop can happen even in bigger babies and they have changed the name to now called as a aggressive rop so in arvin coimbatore rop screening started in the year 2000 by the pediatric ophthalmologist dr robert uh, peterson and it was done by the pediatric ophthalmology clinic and when i joined when i got interested i started going and meeting all the pediatricians to increase the awareness and when i meet met one of the leading pediatricians in coimbatore he told me that he was taught during his pg that the full form of rop is rumba ollu panna mudiyadu i mean nothing which can be done and then now we know it is not only a treatable part of, uh, uh, i mean it cannot only be treated it can be even prevented and we all know that prevention is better than cure not only in in community of ophthalmology or community medicine but it is a crux you know, on almost all the daily activities we do you know like washing our hands before eating filtered water not overeating you know to reduce, reduce obesity prevent accidents by drinking and driving vaccinations fumigation this is all to prevent some catastrophe even you know putting money in a bank balance is to save us some catastrophe in the future so everything is revolving under prevention so i'm going to talk about rop prevention on three levels the primary prevention is in the hands of the pediatricians not the ophthalmologists and if they can alter the risk factors mainly the oxygen control this can be dramatically reduced the secondary prevention is in our hands by timely screening and the tertiary prevention also is in our hands by the appropriate intervention so primary prevention the main risk factors are the gestational and birth weight not much can be done to alter this when the child is born with that so you can alter this but oxygen is one of the main risk factors which can it is in the hand of the pediatrician and we he can i mean the pediatrician can alter it and the other risk factors although important they haven't been in, integrated as much as importance as the previous uh, risk factors there are some protective risk factors also like systemic steroids given by the gynecologist 24 to 48 hours before the delivery of the preterm baby uh, dexamethasone or betamethasone and surfactant given to the child after birth also can protect the baby from rop now gestational and birth weight are inversely proportional to the rop and and why is that you can see this diagram the in utero the blood vessel starts growing from the optic disc from 16 weeks of gestation and it keeps on growing till the full term till birth so if a child is born prematurely say around 24 or even lesser than 20 weeks so what happens is that obviously the child is born with a lesser vascularization and with a larger avascular retina and obviously these child children are more risk for rop and if the child is born with a lesser gestational age obviously they'll have a lesser birth weight also and that is why gestational age and birth weight go hand in hand and, and they are inversely proportional to the rates of rop now now coming to oxygen now we all know that the uterus i mean the fetus in the uterus is very sinus and none of the arteries in the fetal in the fetal body carries pure arterial oxygen so you must know the fetus is in a very very hypoxic environment so if the child is born at 28 weeks of gestational age actually the child should have been hypoxic and sinus for another 12 weeks in utero and if such a infant is subject to the same oxygen as a full term even the atmospheric oxygen is actually less it can possibly be toxic now treating hypoxia is not the same as inducing hyperoxia you know the neonatologists use high concentration of oxygen to you know to treat or abort rds but if they don't stop after that what is going to happen that the high oxygen levels may already affect the peripheral vascular retina and this is the cascade which will happen that you treat the hypoxia and if you don't stop goes to hyperoxia free radicals and cell death now this is a baby with an aggressive uh, rop in both the zone 1 and to see how much was the avascular retina involved we did a fundus fluorus in angiography and we were shocked that the entire capillary network from the optic disc till the ora serrata was totally wiped out so going by this diagram we would assume this this child must have been born at 16 to you know 20 weeks which is which is you know almost impossible for survival but seeing this picture we might think that the child must be an extremely preterm baby but we were shocked to see that this child was born actually at 33 weeks of gestational age and at 33 weeks the blood vessels should have been already in anterior zone 2 or zone 3 not in zone 1 however the child was given unblended oxygen immediately after birth for 12 days and at 22 days after birth we saw this uh, baby and we did this uh, fundus fluorus and angiography that is this 10 days of stopping oxygen so this is classically seen and described in the oxygen induced retinopathy in the mouse model which is done in the west in the lab 
what they do at the seven day of life the mice which have sort of immature vessels as you seen in a human preterm baby they are subjected to 75% of continuous oxygen for five days next five days they remove the mice in the atmospheric oxygen that is 20% and after 10 days they saw that there was a severe capillary dropout in these uh, in these mice and this is what we are seeing here and uh, this was uh, this was just demonstrated in experimental uh, animals but this was now acknowledged after our publication uh, in 2012 and it was acknowledged by the third icrp i mean the third uh, uh, world rp congress in shanghai now coming to the oxygen concentration and saturation you know both sound quite similar both are percentage but you know there's a saying called same same but different but both are dramatically different now this is let's go, let's go previously 1956 this was the article which was published by kinsey it was called retroventral fibrosis that time and based on this article only the first epidemic of rop ended in the west and what are the recommendations that for all practical purpose no concentration of oxygen in excess of that air is associated with developing ROV. So air is 20%. So if anything more than 20%, there is a risk of retinopathy prematurity happening. And recommendation two is that the concentration should never exceed 40% of oxygen. And this was widely and publicly, you know, given in the May, in the lay and the medical uh, communities. And that is how the first epidemic ended there. And they said, if the child requires oxygen, it has to be monitored and it has to be given at the lowest concentration. But what happened after 1956, 1972, the saturation become, because now we got the easy pulse oximeter reading. And then they thought, okay, this is much easier to monitor. But with this, the concentration went for a toss and nobody gave concent, I mean, and they just forgot in time. But let me remind you one thing, the oxygen saturation can never, never go beyond 100%. 100% is the peak. But if you see, if you give more concentration of oxygen, the PO to the partial oxygen pressure in the arteries can go well beyond 100 millimeter of mercury. In fact, it can go to extremely toxic levels of high concentration of oxygen is, is uh, given to these babies. And it's extremely difficult to monitor this because it is done by the ABG, the, uh, the arterial blood gas. And it's not easy to take the arterial blood and, and do it. It's not available everywhere. So these are uh, the ROP epidemics. First, it happened in 1940s and 50s when NICUs were just introduced and babies were supplement given supplemental oxygen to all the babies who were surviving. And then they found then the Kinsley article came and then they restricted the oxygen and it dramatically fought. Mind you, it was called retrorental fibroplasia because there was no way to see the fundus during that time. They would not know what is happening. They would just see a white reflex. And it ended this epidemic even before the ICRP classification came, even before any screening guidelines came. So these guidelines and classification are all based on the second epidemic which started happening in the West when more and more preterm babies started surviving. And then they saw that the gestational and birth weight is more important than oxygen. However, the oxygen concentration has to be less than around 40%. And then what we start seeing in, in the developing countries like India, the third epidemic which was happening in the turn of the century. Now, why should we get the third epidemic? Why can't the first epidemic which is ended and the second epidemic just continue in the lower and middle income companies? And this was the last message. Unfortunately, the concentration nobody is now in many of our NICUs, we see babies getting 100% oxygen and they, and they go 95% to 100% of saturation. So if these two simple things are followed, avoid 100% oxygen. In fact, not more than 40% oxygen should be given and the saturation should be, be uh, not more than 95%. I'm, I'm, I mean, this will dramatically reduce the burden of uh, ROP and screening also. Coming to secondary prevention, whom to screen, when to screen and how to screen. So these are the US and the UK guidelines and we all say India has to have its own guidelines and the broader guidelines but why is that? It's very simple because USA and UK guidelines are on the second epidemic happening. We are seeing the third epidemic which is a mixture of first and two. So we have to accommodate the bigger babies of the first epidemic which they are not seeing anymore and that is why our guidelines are much broader than the West. Now when to screen? Now, in, in, in the developed nation, they say 31 weeks of post-conceptional age or post-menstrual age or four weeks after birth, whichever is later. But the Indian guidelines and all the developing nations, they say we have to screen earlier, 30 days. And even, even earlier at two to three, why is that? The same explanation. Now, this is the natural history of ROP. Whenever, whichever gestational age the child is born, 
immediately the phase 1 kicks in and the phase 2 which is the proliferative which is actually the clinical ROP starts at 32 weeks to 34 weeks and that is why we start screening by 31 weeks of post-conceptional age. At 35 to 37 weeks the treatable ROP happens and by 40 weeks it either regresses or progresses. Now what happens if you give too much of oxygen? What will happen is the phase 1 is super compressed. So the, 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 the timing of the disease which should come later, it comes earlier as soon as the oxygen is stopped and the patient comes in the room air. And that is why we see earlier and that is why we say to screen earlier uh, babies in India earlier. How to screen? The binocular indirect ophthalmoscope is a gold standard and the best way to screen. But now we have the digital imaging for the telescreening and mainly started with RETCAM. The indirect ophthalmoscope is already, I mean, although very cheap, it requires a trained ophthalmologist has a learning curve, no photocard documentation and cannot be used for telescreening because then the ophthalmologist cannot go. So it is the best to be done for local screening inside the city. And, and the red cam, although uh, it is costlier, it is, can be used by non-ophthalmologists, relatively easier to train them, photo documentation and can be done, telescreen can be done and this is for the distance screening. So this is a small video showing the telescreening first. So you can see the team is loading the RETCAM now, uh, like Dr. Nirmal said, that it's a very costly equipment, so you have to take care when you go to the rural Indias, and so he had made a special vault in this, uh, uh, in the van, so that it doesn't get damaged. Of course, now we are getting a cheaper camera to come to that. But you, you see, once you start ROP screening, it has to keep on going every day, and I mean every week to the same NICUs. So this is the schedule in, in Tamil Nadu and Kerala, that every week the van goes, the team goes to these sort of rural areas for telescreening, photo documentation is done and real-time reporting from the various hospitals by the ROP expert. So six days a week the van goes for this telescreening and this was these are the early statistics and now it, it is even more now, uh, babies we screen now. And you see in this uh, government hospital, the van is going and they're taking out the red cam machine. The team already knows how many babies are there. The, the, the nurses have been trained, the NICU nurses. They keep the eyes dilated. So when the team goes, they don't have to waste the time. They straight away go. And this is the data been entered in the red cam. And topical anesthetic because this is a direct contact imaging and you can see that the, the, the technicians, the MLOPs are doing the screening here. And, and this is a video of the indirect ophthalmoscopy done by the ophthalmologist in the NICU. It's the same technique but here you can see the red cam but, and here it is an indirect ophthalmoscope being used. So here required an experienced ophthalmologist, here a non-ophthalmologist and optometrist can do it. And after doing the red cam screening, it is uploaded on the central server where, uh, where the images can be seen by the ROP experts seeing in the base hospital. Report is given and, and goes immediately to the rural NICU. The turnaround time is around 15 to 20 minutes. The printout comes. You can see ROP here. This is the indirect ophthalmoscope. And the immediate counseling is given to the uh, parents of what, what needs to be done later on. And so this is our ROP team, Arvind Koimito, and, and the, the backbone of the team are the, the, the technicians and the MLOPs. I mean, without the help, it is impossible to have a successful telescreening program. I mean, I, I consider cataract screening to be like a ship, an ROP screening like a flight or a train. A ship can sail once in three months or once in six months. It don't go every day or every week. But once you do ROP screening, it's like a plane or a train. It has to go daily or at least once a week. Even if the seats are not filled, it has to go. So ROB screening requires more commitment and more financial uh, finances are required. So the urban tel telescreening program, we started in Coimbatore in 2015 and now it's expanded to all the tertiary eye hospitals and even in Thani. And uh, on, a, on, a, on a given week, we see more than 2,200 babies and in a year, more than 10,000 babies are screened. And this is the telescreening, not talking about the uh, the indirect of the mobile screening inside the city. The various camera systems we have used from Red Cam, the cheaper one, the Forest, still it is 30 lakhs. The Peak Vision camera and the smartphone based uh, camera, the MI Red Cam, 
uh, which costs around 50,000 with the lens and the mobile. And we have tested artificial intelligence with a team in the US, it's called the Imaging and Informatic in ROP. Uh, it was earlier led by, by Michael Chang, but now it is now with uh, Peter Campbell and Paul Chang, who are, uh, who are helping us to test their inter artificial intelligence, so that will save the physician grading time, and uh, we have had multiple publications recently. Coming to tertiary is a screening, it's when to treat and how to treat. This is a very simplified, simplified way of saying that when do you treat. Uh, stage 1, stage 2, no treatment. Stage 3, when it is high risk pre-threshold or a, uh, a pre or threshold ROP, you do anti-laser, I mean laser or anti-VEGF. Stage 4, 5, surgery of blindness and aggressive post therapy, the same thing, you give anti-VEGF injections. So this is a video of the laser being performed. And, and this is how it looks inside the eye, that you ablate the entire avascular retina with near confluent burns, not like a diabetic PRP, in, uh, and this has to be in multiple sittings. I mean, it has to be in a single sitting, not like diabetic PRP in multiple sittings. And you ablate the entire avascular retina, and it goes for uh, regression of ROP. And now we have the anti-VEGF coming in, and compared to bevacizumab, ranibuzumab, bevacizumab, which is cheaper, we used to use quite a lot, but now ranibuzumab is better because the systemic VEGF levels are less uh, uh, things suppressed by ranibuzumab. The vitreous half-life is shorter, and the recurrence is early, which is actually better. So you can retreat the child, because if you give bevacizumab and the recurrence is late and the patient does, doesn't come for a follow-up, they can have a late retinal detachment and blindness. The cost is a factor, but now we have the biosimilar, which works equally well, and now there is a way to split this single vial into two using this uh, insulin syringes, which has a very loaded space, that the dose in ROP is less than half of the adult. So we can easily split it into two uh, in a sterile environment in the theater, and uh, actually the, the cost also comes as good as Avastin, and this was shown by Dr. Ajay Kapoor, my uh, colleague in Batinda. So the pediatric retina, the ROP clinic, uh, we started in 2011, and the dream was to make it one of the leading and the best pediatric retinal in the world and to eradicate ROP. And eradicate ROP into such an extent that uh, I feel we can actually reduce it dramatically. And my aim now is to close down the ROP clinic and, uh, you know, to, so that levels come down so much that uh, uh, it can be almost eradicated. And this idea I got from no one but Dr. V himself because. Earlier, he had started this Arvind Children's Hospital in 1984 to tackle the vitamin A of the Kerata Malaysia. And he has, he has quoted that he was not able to establish the Pioneer Institute and not succeeded in developing Arvind Children's Hospital because, in fact, he was successfully in eradicating xerophthalmia and that's why he had to close down. So, so my, my aim would be like him, like being unsuccessful in, in developing ROP clinic and actually come to get down the rates so much so that we can actually reduce it dramatically. So we have started a, a ROP training program of one month in 2011 where we trained the trainees uh, with indirect ophthalmoscopy and laser on, on this RETI uh, developed by Aurolab. And this is the small video showing a pediatric retina setup. The ultrasound, the red cam is here. And although laser is done in the topical anesthesia, you have to have a GA backup. You can't just take it lightly that nothing is going to happen. And this is the Aurolab uh, Reti eye, which is not like the real, but it's as close as that we can give. We draw this ROP diagram. Something like a like a stage three ROP in zone one. So it becomes a little realistic for the trainees to, you know, do the laser. It's a very, very good and a very cheap way of doing this because this is not expensive at all. And you can use a regular green laser, which is in the OPD, to try this out. Anybody can use it, actually. And we had the Aurolase laser with us for this trainees. And you can see the trainee doing the laser practice on the Reti eye. So this is quite helpful, especially if it's a trained retina person, then they can actually do it, uh, start doing the laser uh, when they go back. And you can see the laser marks being shown here on the retinal film, and we can we can see what are the skip areas, and we can tell, we can train them how else, how better they can do the laser. 
So we have trained more than 100 candidates from India and uh, abroad in this uh, one month uh, ROP training program. And now we have started a one year surgical ROP fellowship also from 2018 where we have more, uh, more than three candidates have enrolled and they have finished the fellowship program. And now we have a one month telescreening for ROP for non-ophthalmologists to come and uh, try this uh, and we can train them how to use the uh, digital imaging and do a telescreening. So prevention is better than cure, but I would say as primary prevention is even better than cure. Because not only will this reduce the burden on the eye care on these populous nations like India, China and all the other things, but it will also reduce the burden on the economy. Because if you see 9 out of these 10 babies having the maximum preterm baby, all developing countries and only US is the only one. So this will actually reduce the cost also of screening. Sustainability like indirect ophthalmoscopy is the cheapest and the best but it's not possible and you might have to invest on these expensive cameras which would require funding. But then if we, we get the pediatrician on board, not just concentrate on eye itself, then actually we can reduce a lot of babies going blind, it will reduce the risk and it will reduce the cost of the screening also. And we can go back to the second epidemic of ROP which is happening in the West and the aim should be I mean, we should also have the same guidelines of the second epidemic of what having in the West and not have our Indian screening guidelines if we get the pediatricians on board. So the next disease I'm quite passionate about is retinoblastoma. And over the period of years, we have developed all these uh, therapies like the focal, TTT, cryo, systemic chemo. And we used to give subconjunctival carboplatin, EBRT, and of course, enucleation. And now we started giving intra-arterial chemotherapy also. And all these treatments have been replaced by the intravitreal and intracameral chemotherapy after you exhaust the uh, systemic chemotherapy or intra-arterial for recurrent seeds. And I think we have the few institutes in India having both the iodine-125 and the ruthenium plaque of the BARC. And because it is made indigenously BRC, it is quite uh, cheap and it can be uh, given to uh, uh, poor patients also. So the genetic testing, we know it's very important in uh, retinoblastoma and we celebrate every year the World Retinoblastoma Day in the uh, second week of May, where we call all the survivors. Recently, the AMRF in Madurai, they come out with a very cost-effective cancer genetic testing for retinoblastoma. So we got this audacious idea of collecting the blood samples on a single day in, uh, in 2017 and we had 113 survivors with the family members. So we collected around 398 samples for genetic testing free of cost. Of course, we required some funding even if it, is, it was uh, quite cheap. Unfortunately, next year, out of the blue, we got our funding uh, from Sun Foundation and then we could do all the tests free of cost. And the following year in 2019, we could give a mass genetic uh, uh, counseling to all the patients uh, in, uh, during the next uh, retino World Retinoblastoma Day celebration. So it is impossible, I mean, everyone wants to have a great life, but it is impossible to have a great life unless it is a meaningful work. And it is very difficult to have a meaningful life without meaningful work. So I would like to dedicate uh, this award first to my family, my, my parents and my parents in love. Without their blessings, I will not be standing here. And, and my, my love of my life, my, my wife and my daughter. And uh, two people who have really you know, influenced me personally and professionally is uh, Dr. Narendran and Dr. Kalpna. They have been my guides, my mentors, my advisors, my confidants. You know? Actually, they have seen in me what even I didn't know I, I had. My professional mentors, now these are the mentors, I, I met them during my ICO fellowship in 2006 when I went to US, invited by Dr. Khalid Twansi in Los Angeles for his surgical skills, a surgical ROP was taught by him. Dr. Thomas Lee in New York, he was the one who pushed me to you know, pursue with this oxygen-induced retinopathy theory in the, in the humans. Dr. David Abramson for retinoblastoma in the MSKCC hospital in uh, New York. And Dr. Lynn Murphy, Lynn Murphy was a retinoblastoma specialist in, in Los Angeles. I met him for a, just a single day in New York when he had come to deliver the Ellsworth lecture. And that really transformed me because he used to help me almost on a daily basis for the next two years on email or how to treat each and every case of retinoblastoma. And last but not the least, I dedicate this award uh, to our founder, Dr. V, who has influenced me personally professionally and now even uh, spiritually and I would also like to dedicate not only to him but the founding members of Arun Eye Care System you know, for being such fantastic role models of the level 5 leadership which is, which is so important in this uh, day and age of uh, social media and I dedicate this award to the entire Arun Eye Hospital family, the, all, the, all the branches, all the staff members 
and I hope the future generations will also continue the same work what the previous and the current generation are doing is preserving the core values and at the same time stimulating progress. So I would like to end that I hope to carry on Dr. V's legacy towards community service in eliminating needless blindness in the world of ROP and retinoblastoma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Parag, uh, Parag, on your outstanding Dr. G. V. oration. So, you are remarkable expertise in ROP screening and dedication to serving the community are truly commendable. So, your recognition as a pioneer and authority in this field is well deserved. So, keep up the great work and uh, thank you for this wonderful oration.